Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Hey, Caroline, how are you today? I'm doing well, Bryce. It's so nice to hear your voice, finally. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We did a little, little uh, behind-the-scenes details here on Overdue Finds. We are having a little bit of uh, technical issues here this morning. Caroline, we got you a fancy new podcast microphone, and it wasn't working too well for you, so we had to go back to the old headset, which you've been using for the last couple of years. Yeah, so if I sound familiar, that's why. Um, <laughs> but my favorite part of that, now thinking back on it, is realizing that you could hear me the whole time, so there was no reason for me to be miming out what I was trying to tell you. I could have just said it out loud. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I had to like type in the chat. I'm like, you can yeah, just say it. I, just say I can it. hear you. <laughs> yeah, no, see, this is, I know you're a fan of the, the morning records, but it might take yeah. me a while to get going. So maybe the afternoon <laughs> ones are better for me. Maybe. We'll have to look at that for future episodes. <laughs> anyway. Well, today, uh, it's just me and you today, Caroline, and yeah. uh, I'm excited. I, I really enjoy these episodes, not that I don't enjoy having uh, other staff members on with us to chat stuff, but uh, yeah, it's always good to uh, have kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one chats on these uh, episodes, and today, it's funny because like, I love a good... All of our episodes have themes, but I love kind of coming up with like a new series of episodes. So like we've got like our pop culture time capsule. We've got our uh, we've got our kids interviews and March Madness and all that stuff. And I think today we may have a new one and I'm excited to introduce it. And today it's going to be the top five. Yeah. So I thought let's kick this off. And uh, I was like, let's chat about like what would be our top five favorite books so yeah. uh you were all on board when i mentioned this to you yeah it's one of those questions that i don't know maybe as a as a librarian i've thought a lot about um it turned out to be harder than i thought it might be um but also exactly what i thought it might be uh which is to say i spent a lot of time uh thinking of possible titles and then ra ended up about where I expected to be when you first proposed the topic. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I love thinking about my own favorite books and hearing about others. So I can't wait to hear your picks. Yeah, this is going to be really, this is going to be really fun. I think probably for mine, you probably have a good idea of what one or two titles might be on there. But for yourself, I'm, I have no idea. I don't know if that says something about me, but maybe I'm not a good listener on the show, but <laughs> that's not <laughs> I'm, true. I'm really curious to, to hear your picks today. So uh, before we get talking about our top five favorite books, let's get into our recent overdue finds picks. Uh, Caroline, yeah. uh, it's been, it seems like it's been probably about a month since we've actually recorded an episode. And, uh, during that time we've had a big kind of Christmas break. Uh, was there anything that you enjoyed over the break that you can maybe recommend today or maybe another title? I, uh, enjoyed a lot of things i definitely got caught up on some movies and books and titles from 2022 uh so if we could go back and do the year in review episode update um that would be great but my overdue find today is a true overdue find in that it was first released over 30 years ago and i have been watching a lot of Beverly Hills 90210, the original series, of course. Um, I don't know why. I, I put it on as kind of my alternate Christmas stuff, you know, because as you know, I love the Christmas season. Um, we talked about Muppet Christmas Carol and all of our favorite holiday movies and everything. And I just love just really soaking in all of the wonderful titles related to Christmas. But sometimes you need just that little bit of a palate cleanser to just kind of zone out, try something different, and then get back in the mood for more Christmas spirit. And this year for me, that was 90210. So um, I, yeah, I, I, I kind of dip in and out. I, then I get into the storylines, you know, of uh, 
uh, Brenda and Dylan and then Dylan and Kelly and then Brenda and Kelly fighting and then Brandon's there, like all of these things. Um, if people are unaware, I guess they could be, of what Ni Beverly Hills 90210 is, it was one of the biggest teen TV shows of the 90s that aired for 10 seasons on the Fox network and starred uh, actors like uh, Shannon Doherty and uh, uh, Tori Spelling and Jenny Garth. So yeah, it, um, that's what I've been enjoying. And some of the episodes are woefully out of date and some of them are scarily relevant. So, uh, and the fashions are just amazing. So Luke Perry, Jason Priestley, like Ryan Ziering, yeah, yeah, and you made me feel so old because, like, yeah, I totally remember when that show first came on, and I was in, I think, junior high maybe when it the show first premiered, and like it was absolutely huge, and um, like like you said, like you had to kind of be living in that time to like really fully understand how big the show was, and like. Obviously, this is way before Netflix or any any streaming services at all. So, um, you know, probably there would be million, like probably tens of millions of people who would watch an episode each week. And like, I think I remember reading like the stars, like to help launch the show, they would go on this big like mall tour. That's what like teen yeah. celebrities did back in the day. Yeah. Before social media, they would like tour malls and do autograph sessions, and there would be like near riots of like. Teenage, teenage girls trying to uh to meet like luke perry and jason Priestley and everything so absolutely huge show exactly and then by the second season of it thinking about you mentioned this is you know pre-netflix pre uh streaming um the way that they were using the format of television as first counter programming to the iraq war um which most people involved with the show agree that because Fox didn't have anything else to air to kind of counter the news programming that um, CBS and ABC and NBC were doing, they stuck with the show, even though the ratings in the first season weren't that high. But then they were also like, wait a second, we're in California let's air some summer episodes at the beach club and like get everyone in their bikinis and get some surfing going and just, you know, really emphasize this beach life. And uh, that's why the, the show, you know, has like 35 episodes in a season um, it, it because it ran, you know, starting in the summer and then to the, till May or June. So uh, yeah, I've been enjoying it. Um, it, uh, I was unprepared every time when David Silver's singing career comes up, but um, oh, yeah. once we get through that, it's, it's usually uh, smooth sailing for me, for the characters, you know, they've got cults, they've got addiction, they've got uh, betrayal and death and uh uh, everything any you name it it happens to them so yeah epl has the dvds so if you uh have never watched it i i recommend checking it out and if you want a trip down memory lane uh it's here for you to borrow it's fun like you said it's almost fun just to watch for the fashion yeah and yeah you'll it, it's it's a good one for sure yeah so bryce what have uh, you been enjoying lately like most people over kind of the holiday break, I had uh, quite a bit of free time on my hands and it uh, gave me an opportunity to uh, try some new games. And so I put down the Call of Duty for a little while, but I did come back to it, of course. <laughs> Good. Uh, but uh, so one of those games, it's funny, this game came out in 2021 and it was something that like it was always kind of on my list to play and then I never did and then I finally got around to it. I loved this game so much that I ended up, I borrowed it first, and then I bought myself a copy of it. That's how much I love it. And that is, and you're going to laugh, Caroline, Hot Wheels Unleashed. Whoa. So what they've done is this is this is a racing game. And, uh, you know, you think obviously of Hot Wheels as toys, but this one kind of really is kind of geared towards people of all ages. So... 
What's really neat about this one is that uh, you get to choose between uh, close to or maybe even it's a little over a hundred different Hot Wheels cars. So, and what's cool about it too is you get to actually race on those like little plastic like Hot Wheels tracks that you can buy with like the loops and everything. Yeah. So that's what this game is. Like it's kind of miniature. So it like shows you like racing in somebody's basement or maybe it's like the living room or something like that. And this like really cool uh, Hot Wheels track is set up and you're in your car and you're racing against like 12 other racers on it. So you can also play it online up to, up to against 12 different people or you can just kind of build or or else you can just uh, play against uh, the computer. You can even build your own track in the game, which is really fun. And what I love the most is you can actually use different pop culture vehicles in the game. So you can unlock these. So you can uh, control the, the DeLorean from Back to the Future. My personal favorite I've been using lately has been Kit from Knight Rider. Um, yeah, and you can upgrade your cars the more you race. So this is a fun game that really, it's funny because I recommended I recommended this game to a friend over uh, the holiday break. Actually, former guest uh, Jody Young. And he was telling me, so he ended up buying a copy himself. And uh, he was telling me afterwards that uh, now he can't get back on the Xbox because his daughters are like absolutely obsessed with playing this game. So uh, we have it pretty. We have it on all systems here that you can borrow from uh, EPL. And uh, yeah, no matter what your gaming level, uh, Caroline, I could. I know you're not a big like Xbox or PlayStation person, but I could put the controller in your hand, and I think you'd have a fun time with this game. That's good because I'm not really a, an Xbox PlayStation person. I'm also not a very good driver, so um, it's it's really not hitting it. But I think I would have a good time with it. It sounds like like that the experience of it would be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's neat. You unlock these different cars and kind of take a look at them. And the more you drive them, your cars will get like scratches on them and everything. The detail on this is is pretty incredible. Well, I, that does sound like something that I might need to check out. So, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right. So let's get right into it today. Uh, of course, as we mentioned at the top of the show, we're doing kind of a new feature, or new series on the show called Top 5. And uh, we thought today, let's start off with books. We're, we're a library podcast. It would seem crazy not to start off with uh, books on on this series. So, Caroline, I'm really curious. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to alternate picks. And uh, so, Caroline, how do you have your picks order? Are they random? Like, how did you go about, like, actually choosing or setting up your top five list? I don't know that I actually could do like a merit-based top five list where my number one is my number one favorite book of all time. I don't think um, I can really say that at this point. So what I did was uh, I have my picks uh, chronologically by me. So they're kind of how I came to them at in the order that I came to them. Um, so that's not necessarily publication order, uh, you know, but uh, just kind of where they were at um, in my life. What about you, Bryce? Oh. Did you do oh. like a strict, this is my number one book? Yeah, that's what I did okay. for, for mine. Um, I, I like it. your, I love your idea though, of kind of like when you maybe discovered that book in your life and everything. So that's, that's neat. But yeah, I, this one was definitely hard as, as you mentioned, it was, it was really hard to come up with a top five book list helps kind of, uh, I was looking at my own bookshelf here at home and I was like, okay, yeah, that one, and a couple almost made the cut, but then they didn't. Uh, but it's funny because like I was looking at my list afterwards and we'll you'll hear it here in a moment, but um, I ended up like covering quite a few different genres in mine, which I and I didn't set out to do initially, but I was like, oh, man, I've got a little bit of I got a little bit of everything in here. So, uh, yeah, it was it was, this was a fun exercise to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. So uh, do you want to start with your number five? Sure, I can. So this is my number five all-time favorite book. Uh, so 
I love books that are written kind of like interviews, kind of like an oral history of, of something. We've talked about this in the past where it's kind of like Daisy Jones and the Six. I know that's fiction, but uh, or Motley Crue's The Dirt is a good example as well, where it's like kind of uh, interviews, little like sound bites, if you will, uh, from somebody. So um, one of those books actually uh, written like this is uh, from author James A. Miller. He's put out some good ones about kind of, uh, he, he'll look back on the history of ESPN and HBO, but it's book, but it's his book on Saturday Night Live that I'm a big fan of. So uh, my, number, my number five pick is Live from New York by James A. Miller. And uh, SNL, of course, has been on the air for close to 50 years, and you could argue that it's probably one of the most influential TV shows of, of all time. So uh, the book kind of features quotes and interviews from probably close to, like, if not maybe over 100 people who have either worked behind the scenes, crew, writers, cast members, and hosts who are involved with the show. Um, the early days of the show are absolutely wild. It kind of goes into these like cocaine fueled all night writing session binges kind of details on how the show is set up, especially in the seventies. Things were definitely a lot more wild then than they are today. Uh, we learn how a uh, young Eddie Murphy pretty much saved the show from being canceled in the, in the early eighties. And this is like a 19 year old Eddie Murphy coming on the show. And of course, uh, the book also covers the wild 90s, kind of with cast members like uh, Chris Farley and uh, Adam Sandler and kind of those years and really leads up into kind of like the Will Ferrell years of the show. Um, there's also, and uh, it's funny because the version I have kind of ends with like almost kind of like the Will Ferrell years, but then uh, there we do have in our collection like an updated version that kind of covers up to the 40th uh, season of the show. And, uh, but it really, I'm not a big fan. Well, it's interesting just as kind of an, a huge oral history of the show, but it's the stuff in the seventies and eighties that I, I found to be most interesting with reading this book. So, uh, this is one I have in my own collection, pretty much actually all these books today I have in my own collection. Uh, but I, I really love this one. It's uh, it's a book that I can go back to easily. Yeah. I remember reading that and just being blown away by how it, it the setup of it does not seem conducive to putting out a tightly orchestrated comedy live comedy show every week when you see what's going on behind the scenes but then i love the stories of like how you know in the first couple of seasons jane Curtin just kind of like opted out about the um the the drug lifestyle happening she's like no i'm gonna go home i'm gonna get a good night's sleep and then i'm gonna come back <laughs> and i'm gonna do my job and uh uh like seeing that echoed later in the the tina fair where she's you know talked about restructuring some of what they did to be like the only reason we do it this way is because we've been doing it this way since the drug fueled 70s and 80s so caroline how about you what's number five on your list so i'm gonna start with uh i believe i've mentioned it on the show before uh it's what i call my book crush the one that um i kind of fell for first which is why it's number five on my list and that is the outsiders by se hinton so i found this came to this book uh, as many people do through um a class an english class where we were reading it and uh i just fell for this story of um these uh this pack of boys from uh the the wrong side of town the ones who had to scrap and fight their way and uh were at times trying to shed the title of greaser and then some of them were also really leaning into it and then you have rumbles and it, again similar to the coke 
uh, infused <laughs> SNL. Uh, this was very different from the environment where I was growing up. You know, we didn't, I didn't participate in a lot of rumbles. Uh, so uh, that surprises me, Caroline. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but even, even things like going to the drive in at this point were, were different. And uh, the way that S.E. Hinton was writing about it, you know, you did kind of feel like you were there and um, in the middle of it. And you were really feeling for, um, uh, the characters of uh, Pony Boy and Johnny, and then in the, in the movie version of The Outsiders, I mean Johnny's played by uh, uh, Ralph Macchio, who's like, how do you not feel for him? You know, with all of the stuff he's got going on in the story, and then so it, uh, yeah, The Outsiders. I think I was charmed by it, uh, taken by it, swept up by it, and it's a a perfect book to. Um, to kind of fall for for the first time i think so um yeah that was um one of my very first favorite books nice that's cool yeah i've only seen the movie um i've not read the book but i've i think that's one where maybe if i was kind of creating a list of books i need to read it's that sounds like one i I absolutely have to. It seems like essential reading for really anybody. It was for a really long time, and I, I still stand by it. I think one of the great things of today's publishing is how diverse it's become. And, you know, for a long time, uh, specific stories were, were used as kind of a stand-in for um, all youth, and now we're getting more books with... Um, you know, female protagonists, non-white protagonists, uh, protagonists of color, um, uh, gay or, or LGBTQ characters in there. So I think the, there's continuing to be published a, a number of really great books that speak to um, a number of different experiences. But um, The Outsiders, uh, when taken along with those other books, um, is still worth checking out, I think. Cool. All right. So my number four book is from an author that not everybody's a fan of, uh, but uh, my number four book is Choke by uh, Chuck Palahniuk. And uh, so the first Chuck Palahniuk book I ever read was Fight Club, but it's Choke that kind of made me a fan of his work. So uh, his books, of course, and this is why I kind of, you know, he's got a very kind of his books don't appeal to everybody. I'll just I'll just put it that way. But they're twisted. They feature some of the darkest comedy, and uh, they can be offensive maybe to to some readers. Uh, but uh, choke though, if you're not familiar with it, it's about a man named uh, Victor Victor Mancini who works at a colonial theme park and uh, visits his mom who lives in who lives in elder care. So since her medical bills are piling up, uh, he's devised a scheme uh, to pretend to choke on pieces of food while dining in upscale restaurants. Uh, he then al- he then allows himself with through his scheme to be saved by these fellow patrons who kind of start feeling responsible for Victor's life. And they go on to send him checks to support him. Some people send him birthday cards. So he's all doing this to kind of help pay for his mother's uh, medical bills. And then he also does, you know, some other things that I probably shouldn't mention on here. But uh, basically, Victor is kind of this anti-hero and his journey is fun to go on. Um, I love the dark, twisted humor with this book and I know Chuck Palahniuk's work doesn't really appeal to everybody, but, um, this sense, this sense of humor, this you know, kind of a dark twisted humor is something that, um, I, I don't know. I find to be very entertaining to read. Um, his books are always, and also for me too, I've mentioned on the show, I'm kind of a bit of a slow reader. His books are always like pretty short, like 200 pages, 230. Uh, they're very short to the point. Um, yeah, I just enjoy his writing. And for me, uh, Choke, I think, is his uh, best work. Has it been adapted into a movie? Yeah, it was uh, turned into a movie, I think, in 2006 or 2007, I want to say. And uh, uh, Sam Rockwell uh, plays actually Victor in the movie. It's not, it's not a bad movie, but... Um, Obviously, this is one where the book is the book is way better anyway. 
Um, that ties actually nicely into my next book, uh, which is The Cider House Rules by John Irving, who is another author that's not for everyone, and another movie adaptation that is good, but the book just gives you so much more. Um, so this is the story of... Uh, well, it's a it's a story of a lot of things, really, but it's it's mainly um, uh, Doctor Larch who is um, runs an orphanage in Maine, and uh, Homer, the unadoptable orphan who grows up at the orphanage, and uh, he there's. Um, in the movie, it's a montage. In the book, it's kind of a series of passages of you know, uh, Dr. Larch trying to find Homer, the the family that he is, needs, and just it just not working out for any of them. And so he grows up as the apprentice to Dr. Larch and um, w eventually goes out and uh, lives and works in a uh, cider uh orchard it, i almost called it a ranch <laughs> for some reason uh yeah rope in those uh, yeah apples. <laughs> yeah you know uh um where they they make all kinds of uh different things there in the in the cider house and um it just it's it's his story in the book the movie is is you know 90 minutes 120 minutes whatever it is self-contained narrative more or less the book spans homer's entire life uh so there's a whole so like storyline with um him and his child that the movie doesn't even touch on it's like you could make three more movies out of this one book john irving um the cider house rules was the first john irving i ever read and it was this just modern dickens like story of these characters who were so strong and uh the character of dr larch is the one of the only instances i can think of where having seen the movie and he's portrayed by michael Caine in the movie um the Dr. Larch that I have in my head is still the one from when I was reading. Oftentimes they get replaced by the movie portrayal mm -hmm. with the actors in it. But now if I were to go back and read it, it's still the Dr. Larch that I imagined the first time because it's just so strongly um, written there. I, I talked a little bit about John Irving in the Stand By Me episode when we touched on um, A Prayer for Owen Meany and... Uh, I went from Cider House Rules through my John Irving period of, of reading uh, a lot. And I mean, you know, even when I said, you know, Maine, uh, wrestling, uh, bears, <laughs> like we're, we're, this is definitely John Irving territory. But this period here of um, Prayer for Owen Meany, Cider House Rules, Widow for One Year, that's kind of where where I really was was enjoying his work I, I saw an article recently around is john irving still relevant and uh, i didn't actually read it so i don't know the answer but <laughs> um it, that for me was um another book that i just kind of fell into and um helped me to understand the power of really strongly drawn characters i had never read a john irving book i've seen um, Simon Birch, which is a adaptation of uh, Owen Me, but uh, yeah, there's a couple of his books that I've kind of wanted to always read. Cider House Rules is one of those. Um, World According to Garp is is another one too. I'm not sure whether or not you've you've read the book or what your thoughts are of it, but um, yeah, just his his writing is always there and definitely something I've definitely his work is something I've always wanted to explore. So what's next on your list? Uh, number three for me is uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl. And uh, I don't remember when I first read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I do know it was sometime, obviously, in elementary school. And I was probably, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years old, maybe. But the story of little Charlie 
uh, Bucket and his family became an instant classic. If for some strange reason you're not familiar with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, of course, it's about uh, Charlie Bucket, a little boy, and his mother is uh, works like three jobs to care for him and his like four grandparents and who all live in the same or who all like lay in the same bed together it's it's really weird and i'm sure really disgusting but uh, basically the story though is willy wonka the chocolate maker eccentric chocolate maker he puts on this contest where he's putting golden tickets and chocolate bars all over the world so five lucky boys or girls will get to uh will have to buy chocolate bars and find this golden ticket and then they get a tour of his factory which he's never opened up to the to the public before so um is this is like a great story for kids really of i don't want to say all ages but kind of around that like seven eight years old uh mark anyway but i think maybe it was the constant talk of chocolate or the whimsy and danger of willy wonka's uh chocolate factory but it's a story that's always stayed with me i do think uh, obviously, the Gene Wilder movie probably helps with that. I'm not a fan of the Tim Burton version uh, remake, but uh, the book came out in 1964, and this is something that's probably similar to uh, The Outsiders for you, Caroline. This is a book that just kind of stands the test of time, and uh, it's really cool to see new generations discovering this book all the all the time. So, um, yeah, this is just something that's always kind of stayed stayed with me it's been years like years upon years since i've last read it but uh it's always kind of something that uh it's a book that i'm just very fond of i we've had a couple opportunities to talk about uh, charlie and willy wonka on the on the podcast before and we we've kind of teased it and talked about it off mic but i don't think we've ever captured it in an episode bryce what are your feelings on grandpa joe (laughs) uh yeah Listen, Grandpa Joe, and maybe this is why I have such a strong, strong feelings about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but Grandpa Joe I'm, is a leech. He could have gotten out of that bed to help his poor daughter work, but, you know, Charlie brings home his uh, magical, his uh, golden ticket to the Chocolate Factory, and all of a sudden, hey, Grandpa Joe's up, he's walking around, he's so excited, you know, but, uh, you know. Grandpa Joe is Grandpa Joe is terrible. One of the worst, least likable characters. He's supposed to be likable, but he's not. He's terrible. <laughs> and I might be part of a Reddit subgroup called Grandpa Joe Hate that just posts memes about how awful Grandpa Joe is. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but poor Jack Albertson, though, like he had an incredible career, but he's known to people like me as being lazy, lazy Grandpa Joe anyway, so... He's much more, Grandpa Joe, though, you know, we're not just talking about the movie here. Grandpa Joe is much more likable in the book than he is in the movie. Well, that's good. That's good. Yes. (laughs) I don't think, uh, thinking back, I don't think I ever came across that in school. I I know that um, Roald Dahl is an often one that is read in school um we covered matilda but i don't think i was ever in a class that did uh charlie and the chocolate factory it's funny because we didn't actually like read it in class per se but it was like i think i mentioned this before we used to have like library class in elementary school where school actually had in a little library and we would go in and we would pick out our book and sit and read so that was one that i i enjoyed from uh, library class anyway <laughs> nice. nice all right caroline how about you uh what's number three on your list okay so for number three um i am up to my carol shields era so carol shields is uh, often thought of as a canadian novelist lived in canada for some uh, much of her life originally from the states uh and swan is probably not her most popular novel or the one that most people have read or even heard of uh i would guess um unless might be one of her more popular titles uh larry's party was a big award winner but for me swan was what really captured my attention and i think that it's because it's the story of this um unlikely 
poet, this woman who lives in a very rural setting, is very isolated in an abusive relationship that ends up killing her. And just before her death, she shares some of her poetry with um, a man who goes on to um, ultimately publish her poems after her death. And uh, she develops this... uh, cult following this academic cult following um in some uh literary circles and this is the story of a number of characters getting ready for a symposium on mary swan the poet uh about 15 years after her death and mysteriously all traces of Mary Swan are going missing. So people are misplacing their copies of her work. The only known photograph of her has been taken and no one can find it. Things are getting misplaced, like all of this. It was originally kind of billed as a mystery and and it, it has that feel to it, but it's less of a straightforward mystery, I think, and more of uh, this kind of study of the way that people can interpret and misinterpret art and writing. And, you know, as someone, I would think I was, I was in high school the time I was reading this and on my way to university. And it was really speaking to me of that, like over analyzing and that, uh, the, you know, the pompous biographer character who is insistent that they know the absolute truth. And then they'll, you'll read a, a segment about like the actual life of Mary Swan and see that everyone is just, you know, blinded by their own perspectives on things. And so from that perspective, it was a really interesting read. Again, characters, you can see what I'm drawn to when it's um, <laughs> when here. I don't I don't need a big story. I, I know I was just talking about that with Cider House Rules with this like story that spans like, you know, 60 years and generations and all of that. I don't I don't need plot to drive the story Uh, you can you know take a bunch of characters and put them in a literary symposium on a rural uh canadian poet and i'm just as happy with that so um carol shields i think has been um a bit quieter i mean her um she passed away many years ago so it's not that she's publishing but uh the 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 Canadian literary world, I think, hasn't um, been f- talking about her as much in the last um, while. So if you haven't read any Carol Shields, I definitely recommend checking her out. And if uh, there's a part of you that really wants to read an academic literary mystery, um, check out Swan. I'll be honest with you, I'm not familiar at all with the work of uh, Carol Shields, but um, yeah, that's it, cool that you that you have some uh, Canadian content included uh, in your in your top five. Anyway, um, yeah, it's funny because I always kind of thought of myself as more of like um, plot driven as a reader, but then you know when you're explaining this book and it's, you know about some of the characters that you really like and everything, I, and I mean I kind of thought of my recommendation of a uh, choke by Chuck Palahniuk, same thing. Like you're not reading it essentially for the plot. You're kind of reading it for this this character doing these um, definitely questionable things. For me, it's it's a little bit of like, are you getting what you expected? Which isn't quite it either, because one of the great things about reading is the unexpected and being surprised by books. But I think if you're looking for uh, a plot driven novel having one that's more of a character study is going to be a letdown um, or if sure. you're looking for a plot and it is more on the plot but it's not as um, neatly um, uh, scripted or uh, there are the holes in it or you have to make some of those logic leaps and if if it doesn't have that that payoff for it um that can be disappointing as well so i think you know i definitely we talked about this i think in our political thriller episode many of those are plot driven right like it's mm-hmm. it's, it's oh, almost yeah. like you know you've got your character is like uh joe good guy 
is the protagonist and that's all you need to know about him right like that's it that's right um because it's about that story and so if i pick up one of those i want a good plot but if it's um a book that I'm just getting into and have picked it up without that expectation. Uh, I, I think I will drift more towards the characters. Caroline, I have to say now, if I had to create an alias for myself, Joe, good guy, that's what <laughs> uh, my moniker will be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will look for that. If I see that in the news, I will uh, yeah. know it's that like, I'm oh, hosting the podcast solo that week. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so top two for me here. Number two uh, for me is Watchmen by Alan Moore. So uh, the graphic novel, which, by the way, was actually named to Time Magazine's top 100 books list. And this was about, I don't remember how long ago they actually released that list. Easily over 10 years ago anyway. So I'm sure that list changes has changed now, but needless to say, Watchmen is in there. So I think what I like most about Watchmen, or one of the things I like about it, is this book kind of got me back into the world of comics and graphic novels. Um, at the time, uh, Zack Snyder's uh, movie version of Watchmen was coming out, and I was reading some stuff online about Watchmen, and I was like, oh, the movie looks cool, doing some research on it, and I was like, I'm, I'm going to go pick up this uh, graphic novel, and uh, absolutely fell in love immediately with with the story and uh yeah it's kind of made me go back and um explore other graphic novels and and stories and stuff like that like as a kid obviously i loved comic books but um yeah there was kind of a stretch probably my late teens through probably 20s where not that i wasn't interested i was always interested but i just didn't really have a desire to pick up a comic or graphic novel and this kind of helped kind of get me back into into that world a little bit so and this is one too that i would recommend people read who say they're maybe not fans of graphic novels or or comic books but um so anyway if you're not familiar with watchmen uh the book actually takes place in an alternate 1985 richard nixon is still the president of the united states i think going on his like fourth term or something like that and uh, the world is on the brink of uh, nuclear war. So, but during this time, though, someone is going around and killing off old superheroes who have become outlawed. So, is this all connected? Who knows? You'll have to kind of read the book to find out. But the book itself kind of reflects the anxieties of the Cold War. And uh, kind of, you know, I remember as a kid, you know, during the 80s and stuff, and uh I mean, not so much here in Canada, I think, like, I mean, there was always kind of like that fear of like Russia launching nuclear weapons at, at the United States. But, um, you know, sadly, with a lot of the stuff that's going on in the world right now, I think this book is more kind of relevant than than ever. Uh, the graphic novel itself, it's funny because they, they were actually released as single issue comics. I think it was maybe a 10 or 12 part series that was released in 86. Um, but then, uh, this graphic novel collection came out, uh, late eighties after it was released. But, um, yeah, this is one that, you know, uh, these next two books that I'm going to mention Watchmen is one where it's like, if you're going to a desert Island, you're stuck there and uh, Watchmen would definitely be a title that I would, I would bring for sure. The way you described it as the graphic novel you might recommend to someone who either doesn't think they like graphic novels or haven't really read into it it's it's um an interesting space of what it does with the graphic the graphic format but then um the the superhero kind of threads of the story because that's such a visual genre itself but it's it's not what you're expecting yet it's perfectly what it is yeah exactly and like obviously like batman is kind of almost like the original kind of like almost like anti-hero if you will but um you know watchman takes a look and it's like the watchmen were this group of superheroes kind of very similar to like the avengers but we see kind of behind the scenes that they're not really all that they kind of appear to be very similar to also the the boys which a lot of people watch on amazon prime but um you know these these heroes are flawed and um 
yeah, it's just a, it's an interesting read. It's not, you know, if you're expecting to pick up, you know, your standards, um, you know, Batman or Superman tale, this is definitely not it. And I was going to say too, uh, HBO did release uh, a couple of years ago, Watchmen HBO series. When that series came out, a lot of people were saying like, I'm so confused. Like what's, what's going on? This is kind of weird. And I've probably have actually mentioned this on the show before, but go read the graphic novel, then go watch the HBO series and it will make so much more sense to you. Good tip. So Caroline, what's number two on your list? Bryce. What would you think if I were to tell you that my favorite Jane Austen is not actually Pride and Prejudice or Sense and Sensibility? I know what you're thinking. I would be shocked. I know I'm what trying you're to thinking. pick my jaw up off my desk right now. I know what you're thinking. You're, you're, you're thinking, Caroline, what are you going to tell me? Persuasion is your favorite? Is that <laughs> where we're at here? And I would say no, actually, although I do enjoy it. Um, Northanger Abbey is my favorite Jane Austen because it's so funny. It's um, as much a satire of the Gothic novel as it is everything you associate with Jane Austen of um, a young woman who is at times too smart for her own good, uh, but looking to find her place in life gets sent to uh live uh, or uh stay with uh friends and relatives for a while and you know people get these allowances of x amount a, a year and are there's dating there's deception there is uh inversion of the gothic tropes um that were popular at the time that she was writing it and i think that that is what draws me to northanger abbey it's the playfulness of uh taking in some of the the things that you would expect and then turning them upside down even the title this idea of like northanger abbey Catherine morland the main character in the book uh when she hears that she's going to be going she's like oh this is great it's going to be this this uh dark and uh foggy uh old uh mansion that uh is going to have all of these mysteries in it and she gets there and it's just a house right it's just it's just <laughs> it's just a regular house it's northanger abbey and it's not what she expected um characters whose imaginations run away with them i still think about a scene in there where she stays up all night out of her mind with fear because she's conjured this terrible situation and then she wakes up the next day and and none of it is real absolutely none of it and it's just it's it has that that humor i know i've that's like the third or fourth time i've come back to saying it and i mean that's present in um in a, in in a lot of jane austen's writing um and it's why something like emma could go, lead so nicely into uh, a movie like clueless you know with only a few updates to it because that that base is there but um this is a very specific kind of satire that um just really really speaks to me so northanger abbey uh by jane austen is uh one of the one i don't know that i would take it to a desert island because then i would also want to take something like um an actual gothic novel and then there's two of my books on there and it's like <laughs> yeah this doesn't really give me as much as live from new york so i don't know if yeah. it would make my uh desert island list but um definitely um a title that i enjoy I've, I'll be honest with you, I've never heard of that book before <laughs> in my life. Big shock, I have not read any Jane Austen at all. That must floor you knowing that. I took a uh, Jane Austen seminar class in uh, university, so um, I have covered uh, a lot of her 
writing i've mentioned most of them um just just now um sense and sensibility is probably my next one but then i do enjoy persuasion so uh, i don't know i i couldn't possibly rank my uh jane austens in order of preference but uh northanger abbey is is number one for me has there been a film adaptation i yes i think it was a masterpiece theater um production um of it i think pretty much anything that jane austen ever came close to uh has been adapted at this point masterpiece theater all over it (laughs) young bryce that was uh that was see see that coming on time to turn the channel (laughs) (laughs) all right we've made it to number one we have um long time listeners of this show i'm they are not going to be shocked by the author of course stephen king huge stephen king fan and uh, for me though you know stephen king is known for obviously horror and uh kind of the modern day i've i've said this before in my opinion kind of like charles dickens so um but it's a book of his that's not necessarily scary, but kind of more leaning towards the side of science fiction. And my all-time favorite book, number one, is 112263 by Stephen King. So this one is about a man named uh, Jake Epping, who kind of through a friend discovers that there's kind of like this uh, time kind of time portal if you will kind of behind this restaurant so he's working with this uh, his friend basically tells him that he's been trying to prevent the assassination of john f kennedy but he hasn't been able to do it so uh basically this book is all about jake trying to kind of go back in time to prevent the assassination of kennedy because kind of they feel like well if kennedy was still alive we wouldn't have had the vietnam war and uh we wouldn't have you know the country would be and the world would be a better place with him uh if you know with him as president and him not being assassinated in the 60s so uh the book basically covers uh, jake trying going back and kind of setting himself up he's a teacher he sets up a life for himself in the dallas area and uh Yeah, basically the book is him just trying to stop this assassination. But at the same time, though, the one kind of almost like the main villain of this book is kind of the monster known as fate. So uh, he can go he can go back and try and his best to try and prevent some things. But fate's always there to kind of uh, throw a monkey wrench in things anyway. So now. The book, of like most Stephen King books, this thing is huge. I think it's like close to like 900 pages. But, um, you know, credit to Stephen King because he did his research. I know he kind of worked with different historians on this. And there's lots of kind of details about like uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and some of the people that he was hanging out with at the time. And his family is kind of Jake gets a little bit closer to him and kind of the events leading up to that fateful day in Dallas. So uh, just the whole notion of this book of of kind of going back in time. We've talked a lot on this podcast about time travel. It's fascinating topic. But um, yeah, just the notion of kind of going back in time and thinking that you can kind of uh, change change history and um, yeah I think it's something that we've kind of all thought about it at some point in our lives like oh you know if I only I could go back in time and do this differently or stop that or whatever but uh, this book is yeah I absolutely love this book it's um, he's re- obviously I'm a big Stephen King fan he's written some gems but uh, this for me is his best work this every time you talk about this book on the podcast i think oh i'm gonna have to read it i like i want to and then i just (laughs) it just doesn't come to the top of my to read list but maybe 2023 is the year for this book for me yeah i will say there's also a mini series that came out uh, a few years ago um and the mini series isn't bad obviously the book is is much better but um yeah it's I would recommend checking out if you don't want to read through all 900 pages, but the book is much better. I would recommend that over the miniseries any day. Now, Bryce, I need to ask uh, on your, this is more about, I guess, the decision-making process. Did you limit yourself to only one Stephen King 
in the top five if if you were doing or a pure top five would other Stephen King books be in there as well I probably did limit myself on this one and I probably would have only had uh I would have had probably The Shining in there as as well um but yeah it would I did limit myself because I'm like I don't want this just to be a, a <laughs> the Stephen, top five Ste- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty much but uh yeah it's yeah but yeah obviously he's my favorite writer and longtime listeners know if I've, I've talked about him a lot but uh so maybe that number one book wasn't a big big surprise to you caroline at all but uh i'm curious to see now what do you have listed as number one and we should say that it sounds like this isn't necessarily your all-time favorite book but just kind of when you discovered it in your life correct yeah, and uh, this one was hard because so Northanger Abbey, uh, we where we've left off on my l- reading journey uh, is more or less university with my Jane Austen seminar. And so for the last X number of years, I've been thinking, you know, I've, I've come across so many books on here. I was kind of surprised that I don't have nonfiction represented because I do... Uh, love that. I love essays and uh, I have just uh, read a lot about um, movies and pop culture. Uh, all of my, my romances uh, that have come across. But then when I was thinking about it, I thought about a book that I came across again, revisited uh, when I was working in um, the as an early literacy librarian and looking at what makes uh, great children's books. And it was one I definitely read when I was younger, but didn't fully appreciate it until now. And that is The Monster at the End of This Book, which is just a brilliantly constructed but like it is so it is so easy to over analyze and you know <laughs> attribute all of these it's just this like meta beautiful creation uh, and talk about your strong characters i mean grover is one of i think the most singular of muppets you know when it comes to you know, he can put on all of these personas or characters, but at his heart, he's just Grover, and you know who that is. Um, and so this book, uh, highly recommend checking it out if you're not familiar with The Monster at the End of This Book, which is uh, a book where Grover is pleading with the reader to not turn the page and get to the end because there's a monster. But the reader keeps turning the page and then then Grover like just gets so worked up about it. It's like this back and forth. It it's the the journey that Grover goes on with the reader amazing and then the end of the punchline like you'll be thinking about like how the Jim Henson world works for so long after this highly recommend as I say I read it as a child thought it was funny moved on since then now when I'm looking at it it's just genius so yeah it is yeah Uh, I don't remember which episode maybe it was our children's uh, picture book episode or something I know we talked about that book a little bit in the past on, on the show and yeah it's it's uh yeah it's definitely incredible it's funny because uh my recently my brother and sister-in-law they just had their very first kid, uh, child and uh yeah that's a book i think it's funny because i not that i forgot about it it's it's a great book but um that's what i'm i want to buy him and uh my nephew and uh read to him i think yeah to get really the full experience of having a child kind of experience that book would be really fun yeah yeah, so that uh, I think was uh, kind of taking it full circle again uh, for me on my journey. Uh, but I look forward. I think that as I was saying, there were a number of gaps on this. My my list is not well rounded at all. Huge things. So I'm really excited to keep reading, and uh, maybe at some point we'll do an updated top five list, and uh, mine will be completely different by then. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was this was fun, but uh, yeah, let's move into our quick roundtable 
questions. Do you want to start, Caroline? Yeah. What is a book that you're really looking forward to reading in 2023? So with this one, I wasn't sure. I didn't touch base with you before we recorded today, but I wasn't sure if you meant like an up, like a new book coming out in 2023 or just any book at all. Any book. So a uh, little sneak peek ahead at Overdue Finds. Uh, probably sometime early summer, we'll be doing a uh, 30th anniversary kind of look back at Jurassic Park, the movie. And it's a book that I've always wanted to read. I never have. I remember when the movie came out, my younger brother, he bought the book and he read it and loved it. And Your it younger just, brother? Yeah. So my brother only would, would have been like 12 or 11 years old. But yeah, he bought the book and loved it. And uh, my parents didn't care what we were reading. We were reading. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, Michael Crichton's uh, Jurassic Park is a book that um, I want to read before uh, we do that episode. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, finally, after all these years, uh, reading that one. How about you, Caroline? Well, now I want to read Jurassic Park. This is the problem. <laughs> I want to read Jurassic Park. I want to read 112263. Um, uh, when we were are recording this, uh, Spare, the book by Prince Harry, um, hasn't yet come out or is just coming out. Um, I want to be reading that, although I think through the news and media i have a pretty good understanding of most of what's covered in the book already um so then i'll go to a fictional royal story which is book four in the american royals series is going to be coming out later this year um and that is a series i i think i might have talked about it in the past on the show i know i included it in a best of in a year end blog post one year um but it's a book series that starts with the premise of what if instead of becoming president george washington was america's first king and then mm -hmm. uh the royal uh world grew up around that and uh the book has uh the book one uh looks at the life of um a princess who is uh, in line to be america's first queen uh book four will uh further uh explore this series and uh all the drama that goes along with it so um royalty both real and fictional and maybe some time travel and dinosaurs. That's what I've got lined up for this year. <laughs> nice. I would want to say, though, regarding Spare, I'm just looking right now on our website. Like, if you want to read Spare, put your name down for a hold. Because yeah. as of we are recording this on January 10th. And right now for just the book, uh, we have 809 people <laughs> on hold waiting to get a copy but once again we've mentioned this before with holds yeah we there will be more copies coming in like our uh, awesome collections team looks at that holds list yeah i can guarantee we are ordering as many copies as we possibly can so throw your name down and uh yeah make sure you can get a copy if you want to read it but it does sound like i've heard a lot of the interviews and sounds like kind of like the juicy parts are pretty much covered in those interviews anyway yeah and then like this kind of feeling around like some of what you're you're reading around harry's life just seems so raw and the, and i mean like far be it for me to second guess uh uh prince uh or anyone i guess you don't need to be royalty to have the no. ability to not be second guessed by me but um you just kind of wonder, like, is has he processed all of the, like, some of it? Just see, especially when he's talking about his mother or his relationships within, like, his family unit. It, it's, like, I, I want the right amount of voyeuristic. Um, and, I, and I wonder if maybe it's too much. But I, I guess I'll see. I guess I'll find yeah. out when I read it. <laughs> um next question what should we do for our next top five for turning this into a series what are we doing next i would recommend or my idea would be to um, go with best albums like our favorite albums albums are something that like people don't 
people don't buy albums like they used to obviously we've talked about this before but uh, it would be kind of fun to go back and uh maybe try and decide what our uh favorite five albums would be i would live i would promise you this caroline i would not pick best of collections or soundtracks i would keep those off the list interesting strictly artist that's that that would be the rule for for that one okay yeah yeah that that would be interesting um yeah i'd like to see that i think again there would be uh not a lot of overlap if i had to guess. no <laughs> no there wouldn't what would be what would you recommend that we do for our next top five i was thinking documentaries it's a topic that we've talked mm. about in the past i think you know top five movies might be just so broad that it's like yeah. where do you even start but documentaries um might just be that little narrower that um we could get in on that i just love talking about documentaries so maybe maybe um that we might have some overlap on that though i know that we we've enjoyed similar ones like uh mm -hmm. street gang with sesame street mm -hmm. so um yeah i think uh albums and documentary will definitely put those on the list for sure yeah uh, we hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show so that you get all of our new episodes. Please also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, most importantly, tell a friend about the show. Don't forget that we'll have a link to everything that we talked about in today's show notes. And of course, we love to hear from our listeners. So uh, maybe uh, send us your top five books list. And you can reach us on Twitter at EPL.ca or uh, email us uh, your top five list to podcast at EPL.ca or even let us know if you have a recommendation for a future top five topic. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.